welcome to the fifth virtual town hall meeting. I'm Mary Fitch, Executive Director. We really uh, appreciate our sponsor, Washington Gas, for supporting these important conversations that we've been having with our membership. And we're so glad you joined us um, to learn how firms are supporting social justice and dealing with the questions of reopening. We hope to have a really robust uh, discussion today. Um, and we, we also wanna hear from you um, just in an effort to make a safe space. If you're not comfortable posing a question or just wanna follow up later, we do have an email address, talk to the board at AIADC.com that you can use and that will come up later in case you, I said that too quickly and you didn't have a chance to write it down. Also, I just wanna cue you in to the fact that there's a bunch of follow-up stuff uh, related to the issues that will be discussed today. At 5.30 today, our Equity Committee and LIDEA and AADU and uh, DC NOMA will be um, hosting a panel discussion on local firm initiatives in justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And our Fellows Committee, along with our Emerging Architects Committee, will start a two-part discussion on August 26th um, about equity. So there's lots of follow-up here uh, for you to attend. So our agenda, as you can see on the screen here, uh, is as follows. Our president, Robert Holzbach, will make an opening statement and then he will lead a discussion of the panelists. And our panelists include, um, well, Rob Holzbach, AIA president, everybody wave. Um, Mark Fairbrother, AIA DC past president, coming to us from Maine. Christine Bump, AIA, who's a director at large on the um, board, and Will Tays, AIA, um, also a director at large. And from our membership, um, we have Gina Fernandez, a Associate AIA, who's president of GC NOMA, and Michael Marshall, AIA, principal of Michael Marshall Design. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Rob for his opening statement and to start our discussion. Great, thanks, Mary. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rob Holtzbach, and I'm the 2020 AIA DC Chapter President. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you all for attending and to thank our panelists for uh, in advance for their uh, amazing input, which I'm sure it will be. Um, this is our fifth town hall event since we all went virtual. In the first two town halls in April and May, we explored the impact of COVID-19 on our profession and our firms as we were adjusting to working remotely. It seemed that things were at their worst and we were optimistically thinking about how to reopen our businesses as we moved into the early summer. After the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, and so many others at the hands of police and vigilantes, and the subsequent reaction to these events, the veil of equality was lifted and we saw the world as it really is. We all shifted our focus to social justice. Our next town hall in June was meant to listen to our membership and have a discussion about diversity, equity, and inclusion in our profession. We had almost 700 people attend that event. The next town hall in July focused on actions that the AIDC and our profession was taking in response to the call for social justice. Today, we're gonna to focus our attention on our architecture and design firms and how they are creating equitable and safe environments. We're going to address both COVID-19 and social justice through the lens of our firms. The full of impact of COVID-19 on our profession is still an open question. And we know that a true reckoning of social justice in our profession will take many years of work to be fully realized. Sometimes we might feel discouraged about the uncertainty of our future. But I'd like to go back 30 years to describe a success story that can perhaps be an inspiration for us as we navigate these current challenges to our profession and community, and I have to say to our planet. On July 26, 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act, commonly known as the ADA, was signed into law. The ADA is more than just a set of standards for clearances and space planning. It's a landmark of civil rights legislation. I never actually think of it that way, but it really is. Uh, ADA Guides on Standards Reference Book is published by the Department of Justice. Right there on the cover, it says Department of Justice. It's a law. So how did this come about? I'm gonna get a little wonkish for a minute, but I think it's worth it. Back in 1973, an act called the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 was signed. It was the first time that the exclusion and segregations of persons with disabilities was seen as stemming from discrimination. But there was a problem with the act in that it didn't extend to a majority of businesses and entities not receiving federal funds or contracts. 
In the 80s, the National Council on Disability was created to address this issue and make recommendations to Congress. Their report published in 1986, along with other expert input, formed the first version of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was, which was ultimately signed in 1990. The ADA recognized that architecture was literally creating barriers for people with disabilities, resulting in their exclusion and segregation and constituted discrimination against them. Architecture can be a tool of inequity and exclusion, and it took an of Congress to force a change regarding those with disabilities. I was in architecture school when this law passed, and I remember that a few of my friends got part-time jobs with the university to evaluate all of the buildings on campus for compliance, or more likely non-compliance with the act. There was a time when architects didn't even think about these issues, and then suddenly we all had to adjust. Now, fast forward 30 years, and we've come to accept these standards as a basic minimum expectation for how we design buildings. We all just expect that we're going to do this. So let's take inspiration from this and thank those who fought for years to get this act passed. And the parallels to, day, to today's struggles with social justice and the impacts that architecture has on communities are obvious, but it's even more extreme. We need to add to that the fact that we're living in a new world where a global pandemic isn't just the first chapter of a post-apocalyptic novel, and the threat of climate change grows more dire by the day. These are real things that we must address now. With the ADA, we've seen examples of how architecture can adapt and be part of the solution to bring people together. We know now that we need to do more than adapt. We need to evolve and transform the way we address all of these challenges. I would only say that we can't wait 30 years for the change to come. Until we have sweeping legislation that forces change in all these fronts, our architecture and design firms are on the front lines in addressing these challenges. And today we're gonna to focus on action that can help them succeed. Remember, as architects, we are agents of change. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to first, we're gonna break this uh, panel up into two segments. The first segment will be on response to COVID-19. The second segment will be on response to social justice from the firm's point of view. Uh, but first, I'd like to just give a quick update on the, the, up, the uh, actions that our chapter has been taking. In the last session, uh, I discussed in, in great detail kind of the action that the chapter is taking. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat all of that. But what I would say by way of update is that um, and we have uh, Jim Hernandez uh, as one of our panelists today, also president of BCNOMA. Uh, we've been discussing ways to formalize an ongoing commitment to collaborate between our organizations. So uh, I think that. That's, I think, and in, in all credit goes to Gina for reaching out and starting that discussion. So uh, we are extremely open to that and I'm looking forward to, to, to formalizing that uh, connection. Um, and I was going to make a pitch for the, the forum tonight, but Mary already did it. And uh, I, I'm personally attending and I would encourage anybody here to, to attend that as well tonight. Um, so uh, let's go to questions for the panel. Um, first question here. Um, the AIA has been active in addressing in the issues of social justice. And we've adjusted our focus for the year to make this a priority. We recognize that much of the evolution needed to make the profession more diverse, equitable, and inclusive lies within the firms. How can the AIA and AIADC support architecture and design firms with that call to action? I'll leave it open to the, the panel to jump in here. Sure. I, I think if AIADC, uh, again, were to hire consultants that that's their specialty, diversity and inclusion. Uh, in particular, there's one that we've actually designed their um, headquarters, it's called Cook Ross, and they're actually located in Silver Spring, Maryland. And this is what they do as a mission and, and as the uh, focus of their business for corporate um, clients, institutional clients, and I, I think, again, having sort of a third party will make it, uh, if the AIADC were to provide that access to that group, that then individual firms can uh, go to them also uh, through AIADC, it might help uh, on a number of levels. One is just to provide that sort of safe space that some people feel they need, and especially in 
the larger corporate firms or really any firm so that they're comfortable, um, you know, voicing their opinions and concerns. And the other is just, uh, it could probably help with just the financial aspect of hiring a firm like that, that if it's spread out amongst uh, a number of firms, it might be then more effective and, and more considered by uh, firms of all scale to uh, approach uh, them for their services. So that's something I, I would recommend. And, and I will actually make that connection for Mary to that organization. Th that's one that I know of. I'm sure there are others. But uh, the fact that they're local here, I, I think, is also very helpful. Great idea. Um, others? Anybody else have other ideas how the AI can help? Firms? Well, I don't, Rob, I don't have any ideas necessarily as much as I guess I'm here looking for answers and solutions. So I think I'm intrigued by Michael's suggestion that bringing in someone who's done this before has got some expertise would be helpful. You know, I represent a voice of, of smaller firms on the board. And um, for us, you know, we're, we, we struggle, quite frankly. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a white guy and my partner's a white guy. We sort of fit the classical architectural trope of, of how we got here. Um, and then I think the question is, well, how do we, you know, how do we make that different? How do we open it up to more people? Um, I think entrepreneurship is a big piece in trying to figure out ways to encourage entrepreneur. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm an architect, but I'm also an entrepreneur. You know, we, we started the firm and, and own it. And so I think that for a small firm owner is a big piece of it and trying to figure out ways not just to, to address the architectural education, but also the, the entrepreneurial aspect of, of smaller practices and even sole practitioners. And so what, whatever we can do to, to open those doors for everyone, I think would be a valuable uh, asset for you know, AIDC and, and quite frankly, nationwide. So yeah, I, I also, just, to, just to piggyback on that is that, again, you get to start to represent the community that we're working in. And there's got to be a benefit to that because I keep saying decision makers are going to be the community. And when you come to the table and you look like the community, I think that's just from a competitive standpoint that that helps out. So, I, I, again, I keep pointing out the, um, the financial gains of diversity. And uh, I think that's just really key and important. To, to show that um, there's a benefit to being diverse. You know, yeah, I think that, that ties into the two, both of you are speaking to the two ends of the spectrum where for larger firms, everybody is looking to hire consultants. They're creating, how I don't know how many committees they are hosting listening sessions. And so the, the financial piece for them is, is rather easy. It's an easy lift, but the, the reality is what, what's going to happen with that, right? And I think that's where, where the AIA DC and DC NOMA can step in and say, how are we holding you accountable that in six months or in a year, you're actually seeing change in these firms? Even a small, you know, and, and I recognize that change takes a while um, to happen, but, but something should happen, right, in the, in the next couple months. So, I think that's where we're holding, we're holding people accountable to what they're doing in their firms. And at the other end of the spectrum, and I think that's where smaller firms come into play, is providing those resources where uh, not just firm, that small firm leaders can reach out to, but individuals within small firms who may not feel that they can, you know, they may not have an HR director or, you know, they don't feel comfortable going to a managing principal to say, you know, I, I don't feel like we're developing a sense of community here. Um, and so to provide that, that allyship and that advocacy uh, for those individuals who work in a smaller firm so that they can find their voice and, and feel comfortable saying something to, to those who are leading them. Um, and I will make, I'll make a little bit of a plug here. Um, NOMA National uh, does, uh, has a president circle. Um, and so for larger firms who are out there looking for, looking for an answer, um, not only is it a way to, to get involved with NOMA, um, but they provide uh, ca uh, uh, counseling for uh, for how to address these issues. So that's definitely a, a different a different route that you may take, but it, it provides a different uh, type of of support system. The the main thing is that now is the time. People are are interested in this this opportunity, and uh, there are various vehicles. So we just want to make sure that there are people who are comfortable both you know, minorities and, and non-minorities to, to have this discussion. 
Um, you know, it, it, it all started because of a tragic event, but let's, let's take that and, and move forward. I, I keep sounding like a cheerleader for this, but uh, it's an opportunity now, so let's do it. I want to follow yeah. up that, um, that Gina said. Uh, so, Gina, how, what ideas do you have for, for the ways that we can hold firms accountable for what they're doing? I feel like that's more of a Michael question than a Gina yeah. question. <laughs> yeah. Actually, um, uh, within NOMA, we're, we're literally making a, sort of a checklist of things uh, that firms can do. And I think Gina will have that in a week or so. We, we want to, at least here with the DC chapter, we're trying to come up with a template that we then can take to the national NOMA, but then also obviously to the AIA, both our local chapter and then to the national, um, because uh, I, I think here, at least in DC, we're being pretty aggressive about trying to um, set up the, the framework to, to make this happen and, and to make it happen fairly quickly. So that there are a few of us on um, a special task force that are, and I, I keep uh, pointing out that are more seasoned <laughs> and have, have seen, <laughs> seen uh, uh, you know, how things work. And so we're bringing that experience to this template. And, and we're not looking, we're, we're not just looking at larger firms, but also how smaller firms can do this. And, and we wanna make it organic to how things work, uh, both in large firms and small firms. And so that, you know, not unlike you were talking about ADA, we don't even design projects without thinking about ADA. So if we can think about diversity and then soon it's just inherent in how we do things, then we're off and running and, and there are other, there'll be other issues to deal with. Yeah. yeah okay. If I could just add a few words, the, I mean, I, I think all of us have to show real commitment to this issue um, and then actually band together to make sure that it is uh, uh, expanding to our, all our communities. And so for us at CRTKL, we are a large firm. We have just achieved our just label. Um, and we wanted to do that because we wanted to have an objective viewpoint about where we really stood, not just sort of talking about what, where we think we stood. And it was interesting because it was very revealing. Um, you know, there's six segments in the just, just uh, evaluation. Four of them kind of look internally and two of them look externally. Uh, and honestly, we scored highly in the internal viewpoint, but not so highly in the external viewpoint. Um, so that, to that end, we've decided to, to engage in many initiatives to sort of answer how we can better ourselves or better uh, our our uh, ability in these other areas. So we've, we've, uh, we've joined NOMA. Uh, we've joined the president's circle as a patron member. Um, we have engaged in the ACE mentoring program, uh, which is really focused on um, getting to high school students early and, and educating them about architecture and construction. Um, we've also, um, uh, uh, with the large firm round table, um, are starting to work with the HBCUs uh, on the 20 by 20 interview program to sort of actually make a more robust sort of uh, 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 that diversity in our firm. Um, we've committed to the, um, to the Build Out Alliance, which really is focused on the LGBT community and actually having them have a voice and openly have a voice. And then we've also set up funding internally for all our employees for social action committees. So we're looking for the best ideas internally and we are going to fund them. And lastly, we're looking closely at all our partnerships because uh, that's another area where we didn't score highly on to really diversify who we're working with and how we're working with them. So we hope to be um, um, leading the way as best we can. Uh, but as everybody's uh, been talking here, we're sort of in the exploring what we can do and how we can best do it. Yeah, it's, it's funny for me because it's kind of like when you go in for a checkup, you have to, you know, you get those forms, I keep saying that, and, and you sort of check off the things that you know that might be of a concern. So you figure that out and then you look for the solution. So I think that's where we are, you know, um, at this time, looking at what are those issues um, or, or things that we think might be a problem. And then the next wave is, all right, 
this is how you can correct it. Um, yeah, and actually, we're really we're really interested in 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 actually hearing all the voices because we can learn more and do more. Uh, to take the best ideas and actually try to implement them. That's kind of what we're trying to do. Yeah, other, so that's good, Mark. Um, we, we do want to shift the focus to what our firm's doing themselves. So hearing what, what you're doing is, is, is excellent. I got some really good ideas. Uh, does anybody else have ideas on what, what your firms are doing uh, that you could share with us that, that we might be um, benefit our other membership? Yeah, something um, that Smith Group is doing also as a large firm with 12 different offices around the country. Um, we've started, uh, we call it JEDIs, uh, but it's our Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committees. And, um, you know, as we know in D.C., and I'm excited that we're in D.C., you know, we're really at the forefront, I think, of all caring about this and really jumping on it. And, you know, in different areas around the country, it is very different. So, um, something that we've done is we have our corporate committee, but also at each local level, there's committees that are really talking about like, what does that mean in their specific locations, spe specific locales, and specific traditions that have perpetuated some of the issues differently across our country. So um, that's the conversations that we're having. I think the main thing, we don't know the answers, but we understand that it takes time, it takes resources. And it really takes courage to create a culture, I think, where holistically um, we understand that it's not just design, it's not just construction, but equity, diversity, and inclusion is just another facet in what we do as architects. And it actually, like Michael said, it raises the value of our collective work. So those are the conversations we're having and engaging in deeper and meaningful conversations and really providing the arena where anybody feels comfortable talking about how this has specifically affected their lives because I think it is a very personal issue that sometimes someone who hasn't gone through something and might not have that personal experience kind of brushes it off to someone else and so I think providing the arena of conversations where we can really understand how that feels personally to each individual um, really affects then the design conversations we're having across all our projects um, and we're also doing a really cool um, uh, exhibit on the mall called Society's Cage that is a interpretive installation about the aftermath of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor's murders um, and just sort of like how society is reckoning with institutional racism and white supremacy. So that's going to be on the National Mall during the March on Washington. Um, so they are doing some fundraising right now if anybody's interested in participating in that. Um, and we also have some internal equity, diversity, and inclusion scholarship programs that we're making more robust. Um, we've had them for a long time, but also just, you know, making sure that it's at the forefront of everything we do. So I'm excited to see, like, how these conversations are really changing the way we're doing um, and just understanding that it's really going to further the value of everything we're doing um, and I actually think there's a business case behind all of this. So I hope yeah. that as we're moving forward, that all together, that we're putting emphasis on that, that if someone's not kind of understanding this, that there should probably be repercussions in that area. Um, so, yeah. yeah. As I said, the carrot and the stick, <laughs> hopefully more carrot. Um, <laughs> I, and I do know from interactions I've had with Gensler for, not that I could speak for Gensler, but I've been participating in some of their outreach and and in their case it's interesting because it's international in scope what they're trying to do and look at and and as you said Christina there are some things that are local and mm -hmm. then there there's a, sort of an overarching um, concerns and so I, I do think um, that in you know individual situations should be also studied um, I think you know one of the things I want to bring to, to Noma is that there should be more interaction with Lydia here in DC, for instance. That, you know, uh, NOMA is not purely an African-American organization, and there's no reason why uh, we can't have those things fit together. And the same thing with, with uh, women's issues, which probably had more resonance uh, about 10 years ago, and, and I think somewhat started, starting in some of the universities, that there was concerns about um, representation of women in architecture. So um, I, I think this is something that is a benefit to, to everybody, uh, black, white, uh, all, uh, all 
origins uh, all together. So this is our, our, our time, again, not to kick the can down the road and bring it together and, and make it profitable for everyone. Uh, yeah, any, any form of, of discrimination. It, it, it's yeah. not racial, it's, it's it, whatever it is, is that, that's what we need to purge. Yeah, I've had, um, so, with some of the talks that I've given, um, there's one guy in particular who is uh, a disabled vet who said, you know, that there are issues for, for the groups that he's belonging to. So now is just the time. It's, it's not just uh, Black Lives Matter. It's, it's that we can make it work for everyone. So exactly. I, would, I, would, I think it's a really good segue to what, where we've sort of landed at Air St. Gross. So we have, we have uh, offices in Baltimore, D.C. and Tempe, Arizona, and we sort of fit in that, you know, 100 and, 170, just shy of 200 category. And we have a Jedi team as well, and it's been there for, for a while, but it's, it's taken a little bit of time for us to figure out what we want to do, especially because, uh, and, and, and to what Mark and Michael are saying, there are so many different areas to talk about. It's not just about race, it's about gender, it's about ageism, it's about you know parenting and uh, taking care of elders in your family. Um, there are visible and invisible challenges. I think those are coming out more because we are we are all working from home and realizing how important it is to take care of our mental health. Um, so I think there's a lot of different ways that we can be talking about this, and I think it's it's come it's 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 really exciting and and uplifting to see everything come to kind of a head over the last couple of months and in June particularly. And so we, we kind of came to this point where like we got to do, we got to figure out what we're doing. And across the firm, the conversations have been very different. And there's, I think a good example is to say that in some cases like me, it could be equated to doing, you know, advanced trigonometry. Like I am totally in this, I get it. Like let's, let's go and make change. And for some people, and, and this is perfectly fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's two plus two equals four. I'm just figuring out what the language is. I'm just figuring out what my place is in this discussion. I'm figuring out if I should be even be in the discussion because some people feel like, you know, and, and, and to what Will said, and I'm not picking on you, Will, but you know, you're in, you know, a white man leading a firm that, you know, it, it, is, it is a struggle. And how do, you, how do you fit into that conversation? So that what we're doing is we've, we're looking at hiring a consultant. We're in the process of interviewing. I mean, we're hoping that through that process, and it's not just a one and done, like they're going to come in and, and, you know, fix everything, but we're hoping that through, you know, a couple months of working with them, we can develop a baseline for everybody across the firm to say, okay, we're, we're at two plus two equals four. Now let's get into a little bit of geometry here and, and sort of you know, figure out how not only do we want to move forward, but how we are shifting and evolving our firm culture so that it not only reflects the values that we've already started with and what we're a hundred year old plus firm. So we have a lot of wonderful history and culture there, but we also have to say, how do we continue to evolve so that we are addressing issues that, that are buried, you know, under the surface that we don't know that are, that are actually there. You know, actually, you know, I think that Hickok Cole, so we're, you know, probably half your size where we fluctuate between 90 and hundred people. And um, so we're not, you know, a huge firm, but we're not a small firm either. Um, you know, we've just like uh, Mark was mentioning, we're, we're undertaking the JEST uh, program. And so we're, we're working way through it. And it's going to definitely result in us evaluating our employee handbook. And we're going to be re rewriting policies as a result of that. Uh, and we've uh, initially we sent out a, a survey just to get a, a temperature for the, for the office of how they're feeling. We got comments back ranging from, you know, talking about culture, hiring, promotions, diversity in the profession, um, engagement in, in the discussion in our office, activism, uh, philanthropy, and the firm's philosophy. Uh, so we had a lot of kind of good discussion in the beginning. Uh, and, and what that led to was, uh, believe it or not, uh, we, we've not had an HR manager at, at, at our firm. Uh, and we, we recognized there was a need for that. Um, you know, kind of we, we grew up into, into the size of the firm we are now. Um, and we, we, we managed it in-house and recognized that that was not working for us. There was not that person people could go to. Um, but, you know, we didn't, what we did, and I think, Will, this is something that might be beneficial to you. Uh, and I think it's something that Michael was hinting at or talking about for the AIA, is we hired somebody part-time. We, we're not, you know, we, we've got somebody who's going to audit our hiring performance for promotion practices. Um, and they're going to be an ombudsman for the staff on call. 
uh, they, they will be somebody that can call, but they're not, they don't, have, this person doesn't have an office in our office that people can go to, um, but, but this person will be known to everybody. In fact, she's being introduced to, more, to our office tomorrow. Um, and uh, that, that, that is gonna be a service that we've not had before. Uh, I've, I've been, I was supposed to be that person in our office, but you know, not everybody's going to want to come talk to me about their problems. Um, and so that was perceived to be potentially a conflict of interest. You know, there are a lot of, lot of, lot of issues with that, but I think we're resolving by, by just bringing somebody else in. Um, in addition to that, we're hiring a, it's it just like, like you're discussing, um, an outside consultant. We've, we've executed that. And we created a, um, we call it a DEI working group to, to work with this consultant. We're sending out yet another survey to the office uh, to, that's even more detailed. And um, it's going to be used to, to create the, the groundwork for a series of six 90 minute long sessions uh, that will kind of build the groundwork of, of expectations and creating an ex inclusive and in, uh, workplace culture. So, you know, and that's just the beginning, just like you said, this is just the beginning of, of transforming the firm uh, uh, into, you know, once we're not going to be fixed after six uh, sessions, uh, but we're going to be maybe more aware and have better tools to, 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 to manage equity, diversity, and inclusion in the future. Yeah, that, I think that's a really important point. You can't look at this as, okay, I checked the box and I'm done. This will be an ongoing, you know, evaluation and making sure that you're on track and keeping on track. And, and uh, you really do need an independent objective voice to, 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 to be mindful of what the issues you're missing are, because you, you, this will fall off the radar if you don't keep it up. Yeah, I think something that we could all start to think about, you know, I'm sure you've seen the equity by design, like data surveys that have happened in the previous years. And they were at first more geared towards women in the workplace versus men, but they have been expanded to minority and diversity um, and trying to gather that data. And Rosa Shang, who's the director of equity, diversion and inclusion at Smith Group, um, she started that back in San Francisco, you know, like a decade ago. And that's it made a huge difference to see like year from year the data of like how our the firms were growing and i think that we could really that could be strengthened or done through another channel but really understanding how our firm's um, diversity makeup is changing throughout the years and actually could really reflect and show which firms are actually making this a priority versus not. Um, and so I wonder if we could tap into some of those resources that are already set up. I think right now it's like a yearly survey that everybody takes as a volunteering thing, but I wonder if it can be made more robust to include some of the stuff that we're talking about. I mean, I'm, She's I'm speaking tonight on our, our forum panel. She's so awesome. come and see her, yeah. <laughs> Well, I didn't want to, I, I know you're trying to jump in, go ahead. No, I, I mean, I think one thing that the AIDC can do to help facilitate that, particularly for, for smaller firms where it is potentially, you know, the best solution is to partner up with a, you know, outsource that piece and work with a part-time consultant. You know, maybe there's an opportunity to do a, you know, that lunchtime learning series instead of it focused on like the glass or the window shade, it's actually mm -hmm. about, you know, maybe it's the group that Marshall, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Michael brought, talked about, yeah. Uh, in bringing them in and saying, this is kind of how it works. Like, this is how, like, this is how you start to talk about these issues. And, and really, I mean, I would certainly be very interested. And I think that a lot of other folks who, you know, we don't even know where to start, you know, and I think having a group that has that expertise to, to have a conversation where, you know, it's an ability for them to, to obviously pitch their services, but I think it's also a great resource for the community at large to understand, you know, what it really takes to, to, to start the conversation. That's where we are. Yeah, and I think if we can, again, share the cost of those things, you know, for those of us that are smaller firms and the mid-sized firms, just like we pay for the lectures and the, the talks, um, you know, to, to just spread that cost out and uh, everybody gets the benefit of it, uh, is something that I think the local chapter, not only our local chapter, but maybe it's something AIA National says that every chapter should have that uh, service available. And um, so it, it comes from the bottom up, meaning our, you know, local chapter, and then from uh, from the top. So, I, and I guess also in our case, we're lucky that national is here in the yeah. DC area. So, so this is a, this is an amazing discussion. I don't want to quash it, but I, so, but we also want to talk about COVID nineteen. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to ask one more question. 
question on, and we also want our, our wonderful um, uh, attendees to be able to ask questions. So one more question on this, and I've got three to pick from. So I, I'm going to I'm going to focus in on something that um, Christina said. Uh, you mentioned uh, diversity, and we're, we're focusing, we're learning about that. But we we often talk diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so, you know, once we attain diversity, that doesn't mean that we're actually equitable and inclusive. And so, um, one of the things that, that I've come to learn is that the more we talk about this, we we, we develop a vocabulary, and and we we hear words for things that we might innately understand, but we don't have words to describe. And and so, um, until you have that vocabulary, you can't really have a a really good discussion about it. And that's why these training programs I think are so great that, that Michael's been talking about. Um, so just for purposes of this question, uh, I'm gonna define equity for everybody. Um, the way I define it is when all members of a diverse workplace are justly presented with resources, opportunities, and the ability to participate, succeed, and advance in the workplace. That's equity. Inclusion, I'll define as when all members of a diverse workplace feel valued and welcome to participate in safe, equitable environments. So this is a, they're, they're related, but they're, they're different as well. So my question is, you know, once we have attained diversity, and that's that's a pipeline issue, and that's a, that's a hiring issue, and, and just bringing people in, uh, that's going to take a long time. But perhaps we can we can still work on equity and inclusion in the meantime. How do we do that as a firm? Like, what are some strategies that our firms can employ to, to create equity and uh, inclusive environments? Can I jump? Can I jump right in there? And Rob, yeah. I would I would challenge you on that definition of inclusion, um, because okay. I've been I've been thinking about it today, and I was I was reading through your 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 notes for the session, and I think that in an inclusive, I, I absolutely agree in terms of equity. I think, uh, you know, uh, Giselle Santos Rivera has been talking about uh, how you need to have the J and the E before you have the D and the I, and in terms of understanding what justice and equity really mean to an organization and to an individual. I feel that, you know, diversity sort of hits, it really comes down to numbers. And I think inclusion talks a little more about, uh, you know, you are, you're coming to this place at the table for you to participate in the conversation. But I don't think it, does, it necessarily means that you are, are welcome to participate in that conversation or that you're able to bring your authentic self to that conversation. It just means that you are being asked to participate and whether or not what you're saying is going to be valued and trusted. And I'll give you an example. You know, when you work on a team where it's led by a lot of men and you are a woman staff designer on the team, are you really being allowed to put your ideas and your drawings out there? Is, is somebody who's mentoring you on that team saying, hey, you know, you can take the big pen and make some markups here and, and let's see if that generates something different versus, okay, I'm going to sit here and take some notes. So it, 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 is, it is really a question of in inclusion versus belonging and what does it mean to really belong in a team? And that's, I think, once you get Jedi in place, you're able to create that sense of belonging, which I think is what your, your description of, of inclusion really is. But I think that, you know, when we say, okay, we're, we're, we're diversifying our numbers, we're including everybody in the process, it really, I feel like if you jump, you jump to those two before you look at justice and equity, you're really saying we're bringing you into a system that has existed for forever. We can check off the box in terms of numbers, but we're not really changing what what actually exists or is in place. Okay, that's so, huge. So, like, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Rob. No, no, no. Go ahead, Christina, please. Yeah, I think that's huge. And I mean, I think on a personal level, when I think about the people that helped me along the way, you know, males white males that like you know i think rob's one of them sort of like hey i'm gonna take you with me wherever i'm going and like help you out and like um reach out a hand and extend it because i see potential and talent in you and regardless of the structure uh, you know i'm gonna be a supporter of you and so i felt like now that i'm more in a leadership position like i have the ability to do that with people that are that are you know a ones or A2s are just getting into the profession. So um, I've really started to kind of open my eyes like, oh, they like there's some people that getting into that position was much harder than others. And I don't even know about that. Um, but I can ask them about it and I can be a, a person that they can sound off their concerns and I can be a resource. And hey, I'm pulling you up with me when we're coming mm -hmm. like um, and we're all going to do this together. And so I think personally, I've just been trying to do that with 
the people on my teams. And I think, um, you know, as diversity or whatever and hiring is occurring that and now I'm, I'm making those decisions sometimes of, about who we're hiring. So I'm, instead of looking at it as just like on the surface, think about like, what did some of those people have to do that others didn't to get even get to that hiring position? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it kind of puts a weight and it's like, maybe they should have more, more of a say, or maybe we hire that person that we might have not before based on some of the underlying conditions that we probably didn't think about. And that's hard to do, I know, on every single case, but, um, and I'm not sure how to apply that in a holistic way, but I know I can do that in my own personal day-to-day work relationships. Christina, I, I like you said, you said something, Chris. oh wait, I gotta, I gotta say this really okay. quickly because I feel like I gotta give a disclaimer here that I also, I have some very wonderful mentors who are older white men who have really pulled me up. And if they listen to this and they're like, Gina, what, what are you talking about? We're here for you. <laughs> so I just want to put that out there if they go, if they watch the recording and, and they're listening to that. But I, I just want to, I just want to add one more thing to what Christina was saying which, to make it a little more holistic is that for everybody, whether you're in a small firm or a large firm, I think there's a place that if you are mentoring, and I think this is what some of my mentors have done for and for me, is they're not just mentors, they're advocates for me. They're the ones in the room who are going to say, Gina's doing really well on this. We need to put her in that position again moving forward. But they're also looking at me and saying, okay, I'm really good at this, but Gina might be good at something completely different. And that's where her unique value and her background and her culture and, you know, I'm from the West Coast. That can even be, you know, something a little different that I bring to the mix. So how can that part of her be placed into what the firm culture is? And that then changes the dynamic instead of saying, okay, I went to this school. This is how we did it. I want you to fit in this box because this is the way we're going to do it. And I think, you know, when we look at both minorities in terms of race and minority in terms of, of terms of women, that's how we end up putting people not only in a box, but we end up uh, uh, pushing them out of the profession because they feel like they don't have a place to to be their authentic self and to bring themselves into that conversation. Yeah, I think, to, yeah thank you. <laughs> to piggyback on what both of you are saying is that once there are more minorities of different cultures in a firm, and, and I know this from experience, then you're able to see how other people like yourself are being treated. So it, it takes away that level of paranoia that uh, you're not getting to do X, Y, Z because you're black. Well, but if, if there are more people there and you see them doing well, you know, or progressing, then you say, well, it can't be because of my color. So then mm-hmm. you, you start to then try to figure out, okay, so what is it that I can do as a person to progress? And so that's why I, I think just having more, uh, or, or at least a more diverse group of people, you, you can sort of take away actually the 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 color or the culture and then it's the individual but that's why i think we we just need the the numbers now the pipeline is another thing you know as we said how do you get uh more minorities interested in architecture that's that's again another conversation um i work for a firm that i left at one point because i just thought they didn't value me as as a black person but you know i had the same education and all of those things. But I was the only black person working there. So that was my point of reference. And that's maybe kind of a lazy way to look at it, but that's just what I thought. But if there were more uh, black people or minorities there, then I would say, okay, then uh, that's just the way this situation worked out. And later in life, I realized I was taken off of a job simply because they had somebody else who had more experience doing it. And that's how they made a profit because that person was faster at it. And then I would have had to learn. So um, I, I just think more, more people at the tables is also good. Well, w- one of the things I, I want to pick up on, Gene, I think you said is, is just having advocates. Um, you know, we have a formalized mentoring program where um, the mentee picks the mentor um, but I think getting to know people uh, beyond, you know, the superficial level of what they look like and actually understand who they are and what they aspire to be is kind of critical. You know, then you can really truly advocate for people and advocate on their behalf because in the end, it's talent that matters wherever that talent resides. And you want to put that person 
match them up with their goals and the best place to succeed because in that way your firm succeeds. Yeah, but so, Mark, not just talent, but potential. Yeah. You know? Well, it's always potential, right? Because if yeah. you're a young person, you haven't realized that right. talent. But right. unless you have a deep understanding of that person, not, and I think it goes beyond their talent, it's their aspiration. Yeah. You know, and, and actually it, it benefits us all to sort of, to maximize that aspiration because it benefits your, ultimately it benefits your firm. And so that has to start at the very young level. Typically for us, it's those people that actually seek out mentors. And then, you know, it's, it's, it's my job at that point in that relationship to get them to formulate a plan for their future. And then it's my job to help them manifest that plan. And I think all of us as more senior people, I'm an old guy. So, you know, um, you know, I can help them with all the mistakes I made along the way to help them avoid some of those pitfalls and how they even talk to people. Um, you know, and I think that's, that's not only just in the firm, it's just in the profession generally. The more we can help other architects become better architects, the profession is a better pl a profession. And I think we can pull everybody along if we also make diversity, you know, the need for diversity competitive. And so if one major firm sees that that uh, diversity is, is getting this other firm more work or, you know, if there's a way to quantify it, then firm B is going to step up their game and move forward. So um, that's sort of my position on this. Uh, yeah, make I mean, diversity ultimately we're designing, we're designing spaces that every single color, creed, race, religion will be inhabiting. So if only a certain I'm sure we've all heard this before. If only a certain percentage of the population is designing that, you're going to forget about those other people's yeah. needs. Yeah. And so it's like by having all those seats at the table, you're actually creating better design that will be accessible and more better enjoyed by everybody. And I think yeah. sometimes when it's put that way, where there is a business case for it, it yeah, is exactly. actually going to be more profitable because the design ideas that will come out of that will be more, will be fresher and newer and actually more holistic than solving a small amount of percent of the people's of population needs um it'll yeah. solve and everybody the, um, and the decision so. makers in these for our clients are, are, are ahead of us are becoming more diverse so uh again yeah. so that's I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna jump in here and and um we need to move on to COVID 19 but i, I can't I, I don't want to get away from this this is a really good conversation. And I'm gonna work off, again, work off something Christina said. Uh, and this is the last question. Um, so let's step outside of the operation of our firms and the kind of internal working, but let's look at the actual work that we do and the communities that we affect with our architecture. Uh, and that's kind of references the ADA uh, and bringing that in here. So um, how do we as architects who, who don't make the final decisions in the designs, um, how do we prioritize social equity as an important factor in the design of our environment. Well, I, again, I go to the decision makers again. Uh, sorry, Gina. <laughs> You'll um, say something that I can play off of. I'm not worried. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I just know with the projects that we're doing in um, in diverse communities, you know, because I'm just taking Washington as a point of reference. Uh, the demographics have been changing, obviously. Uh, at one point, there was a thousand people a month moving into DC, but the, the communities are asking for that diversity for the people that are designing their communities. I've seen it firsthand. And, um, and so, again, to be competitive, you've got to step up and be ready for it. And Thank I think, you, you know what, I think, oh no, you're fine, because I think that, that kind of plays off of my thought. Um, and it's actually maybe a, a suggestion back for Will in terms of thinking about small firm uh, culture and how to step into these conversations that, um, you know, there's places, there's places and opportunities. So whether you're going through the ACE mentoring process or you're looking at architecture in the schools or you're looking at a project pipeline, I think that there's, it's not just that you are stepping into those, those positions where you're, and, and, and furthermore, encouraging your staff to step into those positions but you're, you're looking at us as a way of saying, how are we creating space for younger designers to design for their own communities, right? And I, I feel, I wish I could remember the example, but I, I feel like there was a firm out there 
who went into a school and said, okay, we're helping you sort of revitalize your school building. It, 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 you're looking for sort of a building it up more to, to help support the students in this community who, who needed the support. And instead of the architects coming in and saying, okay, we're going we're gonna to give you a really awesome design, they sat down with the students and said, okay, you are amazing artists and creative people. How can we help you create a design that you can then put into your school that you can be proud of, that you are changing and uplifting your own community? So not that we are helping inspire future designers in our profession and our field, but we're also saying, okay, we may not be in a place, and, and again, depending on the demographics of your firm, but we may not be in a place to say we, we are representing the community that we're walking into, but how do we create place for a younger generation to be designing and to say, okay, instead of, instead of us doing the work, it's how are we supporting you in a way that you can do the work and we're just here to, you know, maybe make some drawings for you based on your design so it can, it can be built. Well, I, I think I'm really glad that you mentioned the architecture and the schools program. I think that that's something that you know, we participated in over the last couple of years, but I also think it's, it goes to the pipeline issue and it goes to the education issue. And really, I think it's a fundamental building block in, in you know, making sure that we as architects go into the communities that we serve and there's an ability for us to sort of direct where the, some of that effort is being shaped and to really educate everybody about what architecture is and the role of architecture and really getting people at a young age who can understand that it's, it's a career choice, you know, that they, you know, I think having, um, you know, some familiarity with uh, architectural ideas and, and urban planning ideas, is, it's, it's crucial to, to live within a community. And so I think, you know, expanding that program, um, ULI does a, a program that's similar at a high school level where uh, the kind is called urban plan, but there, this idea that you're bringing architectural and urban planning education to middle school and high school students so that they understand the value of it. I think it's one way to, to sort of break down that wall a little bit uh, and help and also entice people to, to come into the profession. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know even, what else? Oh, go ahead, Christina. <laughs> even, I was just going to plug, you know, Washington Architecture Foundation in DC. We do the Design Like a Girl, which is even younger, mm -hmm. you know, nine to 12 year olds and I participate in that and it's so awesome to like just like you know build structural towers out of magazines and just, like you see their eyes light up and just like they like clicks and it's just so cool to like be a part of that um so there's a lot of stuff like that it's yeah really I, I, if I can add to that too is that um when you go into the DC public schools and probably the the majority African-American students I don't think the architects that introduce them to architecture has to be a uh, minority or African-American. I decided to be an architect because I love to draw and mm -hmm. someone showed me a set of drawings. I have no idea who did those drawings, whether they're black or white or a woman. It was just from the, the love of making things and, and you know, understanding what architects do. So I, I applaud you know, that, that AIA DC you know, reach out, outreach. Uh, Michael, you cued, you cued me up for one thought, and then I know, Rob, we got to switch to COVID, but um, the, the one thing I will say, and, and to anybody who's listening, and if you're listening to this recording in the future, I think one thing that's really important is it doesn't matter who you are in terms of inspiring, you know, future designers, but I think you should know who the designers are that are out there beyond saying, here's the star architects in the field who happen to be white men, right? I was sitting in a group about a year ago, and the moderator said, okay, write down the names of five women of color that are talented, amazing architects that are out there. And almost no one in the room could do that. And so it's, it's maybe you're in these programs and you're in these schools and you have somebody, you know, it's, it's, it's about see, seeing yourself. We're having these conversations about seeing yourself in these positions. Well, developing a pipeline takes time, but you can say to a child who has, you know, access in some way to the internet, here's a really awesome woman who you should go look up, who happens to, to be, you know, and you don't have to say she happens to be black, but you can say this is a really awesome woman that you should go look up. And they're gonna go look up that person and say, that, that person that looks like me, I wanna, I wanna go do that. So it, it is it's a part and parcel with, you're inspiring that creativity, because, and, and that's me too. Like I got into this because I was interested in design and I really liked art classes, but I'm finding more and more that, I need mentors across the board 
who look like me, who don't look like me, who are going to help me become a better designer. And I think at the end of all of this, we all want to be better designers, right? It shouldn't have to do with, with what we look like or what background we are. We want to create beautiful spaces and spaces for all communities. So on that note, Rob, I'll let you take it away to COVID if we do have time for that. Well, 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 Thanks, one last Jesus. point on all this that I'd like to make is just, just get involved. You know, get involved in your community. If you really want to understand what the issues are that people are grappling with, be involved in your community. I mean, for me, I chose to be involved in the AIA. Um, choose your choose your platform, but be involved. That's really the critical part. Thanks, Mark. And that, I, I totally agree with that. And that's that was kind of my my involvement as well. And it's shown me the act that you can have by getting involved. And, and it, the funny thing is, my, <laughs> those are great answers. But my question was, I was thinking about more about the, the projects that we design and the impact in the communities of the, of the architecture that we do. And, and, and um, you know, something I've thought about this a lot, how do you talk to your client about the impact that our architecture has to social equity? Um, if you think about the, the impact of the ADA and how we never thought about architecture and design that way until we were forced to. And you know, I think about you know, a, a project that might be going into an underserved area and the developer's got a pro forma and they're, they're going to do this, this, and this, and this, and this. How do you talk to them about engagement with the community? And I think a lot of the answers you gave were very similar. You know, for me, it's about understanding, hey, talk to the community members and say, what, what is it that's important to you? Uh, how, how can we engage you in design for your community itself? So I think I heard that as an answer. I think about it too as a discussion not too dissimilar from the discussion you have about, hey, you know, like, what do you think about sustainability? Like, how, 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 how are we going to create a, a uh, sustainable building that's going to be beneficial to you? And I think you have to turn it and understand, Michael, you made a point about the, the, the benefit to firms for being uh, diversified and, and equitable. And I think it's the same thing with, the, with our clients. Point out to them the benefits, the business argument for why they want to engage the community. You know, I think that if you, I've seen, I've seen developers resist the community and they don't ever get approved. I've seen other developers engage, 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 and they, they kind of, it's still not always easy, but they, they do kind of get through the process and there's goodwill generated there. And so yeah, it's I think- a collaboration. That, yeah, I think we, we as the trusted advisors to our clients can start to, to point out the benefits to our clients of of an equitable design in a community that, that, that might otherwise just kind of be just forced into accepting another building that, that they don't need. Um, so and, and that building might fail. And so exactly. then you look at sustainability in 20 years and you have to take that building down because it didn't work. And yeah. so another wasted effort. And that's why diversity and sustainability are, it's this, it's, it's together. Yeah, and I so think I mean, gonna... your education is a big is a project type that I think already does a lot of these things because it's like the community and like focus groups and feasibility is like it's built in to the way that it, it works because you need to get that approval from like the faculty, the staff, the students. So you get that input already. And it's like sustainability on all the projects I've worked has been top priority because I think the students demand it. And um, it's like, I'm not going to go to a school to a place that is gonna, not going to provide this for me and provide these awesome spaces. So I think similarly in diversity and inclusion, I think mm -hmm. that that's going to be a demand as well. I'm not going to go to school to a place that doesn't include everybody. Um, You're so not going to go work at a firm who doesn't include everybody and put that on their website. Yeah, that's a big thing. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Um, <laughs> <it's cold>. Enthusiastic. <laughs> um, hard to, hard to kind of get back. And so, um, Let's focus on, on COVID-19. Now we're gonna take 10 minutes to focus on COVID-19. We have about half an hour left. Cause I do want, I see that there are some questions already from, uh, from our attendees. We're gonna address all the questions at the end. Uh, and I think, you know, we'll get through COVID-19 in about 10 minutes. Um, Cause frankly, I think it's, we're gonna find there's just a lot of uncertainty out there still. Uh, so my first question to the panel is, uh, you know, we're, we're right now in phase two of reopening. Um, and they basically, the, the recommendations are you know, stay distant, wear masks, modify your office layout, work on staggered schedules, um, you know, rotating schedules. But, you know, our profession is geared around working collaboratively and together. And so, you know, th that's almost antithetical to the way we want to work. Um, how do you 
and how, what are your firms thinking about in terms of re-entering the, the workplace uh, in a way that that's that's really everything is geared towards not allowing us to work the way we want to work. Yeah, that's a tough. Oh, one. I have to have anything on our desks. <laughs> we have yeah. a we have a hot desk policy, and you're not allowed to leave. You're not allowed to. If you're using paper, you got to scan what you have and get rid of it at the end of the day, and you cannot leave anything on your desk. And I have a blue chicken on my desk, and it's got to come home with me. <laughs> Yeah, we've, we've already we've already purged all the personal items from desks, and we're going to you know a hoteling type of situation. But your your point is the the right one, Rob. Is that great to go to the office and work in isolation? But that's not a lot different than sitting at home and working in isolation. That's not where the magic happens. You know, the magic happens in the room, and uh, you know that's a tough one. You know, because we we're we're stuck with this uh, this COVID, and we want to keep people safe. That's primary. But we also want to have the culture, uh, which is really born out of the collaboration. And so we have not sorted that out, although we've come up with a date we would like to re-enter the office. Um, but our primary goal is to keep all our employees safe. Yeah. Yeah, we've yeah. established a, a thing called non-judgmental flexibility. So none, we're, none of us in DC are back in the office um, and we don't foresee that. flexibility. The entire year so not till 2021 um, but it's really about allowing each individual to do what they feel is best with them without like concern of their responsibility level or career level um, and this was after you know multiple surveys town halls q and a's where you know i think different people of their parents if you're um you know if you have caring for elderly people in your family like that's a big concern coming back and like you guys said, um, you know, you're just going to be sitting alone. So the collaboration is not really going to be facilitated by being in the office. Um, so we're, we're all still working remotely, at least in DC and our other offices where some of the government regulations ha are different in other states, they have started to open. But um, it, I think we've sort of proven that we can all do our jobs remotely. Um, and I think in a, in a lot of ways it has facilitated um, the work-life balance that I think uh, is hard in architecture. And so in a lot of ways, I don't think that we'll ever go back to a full-time work at the office type of scenario, because like, at least for me, like I love working from home. I would, I would like to do it like half of the week. And I actually think I'm a better architect when I have the social time at work that's more collaborative. And then I have my quiet, uh, you know, put my head down and work at home. Um, and don't have to like wear pants and stuff. So it's like, I, I, having, I think having that balance actually makes me a full human when I think before when it was like, go, 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 always at the office, it felt more stressful. Um, and sure, I'm working more in some ways remotely than I was uh, on some weeks than I was in the office. But I do think we'll have to, even when COVID goes away, that we've proven we can do this remotely. So I think some people will demand it. Yeah, I, it's funny because I thought this is going to change how we look at maternity leave. I think that women will be able to stay, you know, somewhat engaged, not not as much, but it's it's going to definitely uh, working remotely now is is viable, and I think that's going to be fine. I, I have um, one employee who's itching to go back into the office, so we have the opposite. Uh, but we're a small firm, and, and I say, yeah, if you want to do it, do it. But you'll be there by yourself, you know, for the most part. Um, so it's it's been uh, interesting, you know, uh, looking at how this might work now from now on. It is a t it is a technolo technology issue. Some people might choose to go into work because it's just they, they're more productive in the office, using given the the computer equipment there. Yeah, not only that, just to commute for some people who live you know, an hour away or something like that. That's different. I, I remember when we first started doing this, <clears throat> I thought I was being super productive. It's getting stuff done. Then I realized working to eight o'clock. <laughs> so, not a good thing. Yeah, not a good thing. So that wasn't being more productive. It's just a longer day. <laughs> yeah. You've got to have a hard stop. I've, I've actually put alarms on my phone now to remind me that, okay, maybe it's time to turn off the computer <laughs> and, and not look at a screen for a while or not be on a Zoom call. Um, one thing I would I would suggest for everybody, and, and it's something that came up when we were preparing for this panel, and, and, and Christina said, and, a bit, and I, I've been thinking about what you said, you know, for a couple days now, um, is is about that that mentorship and that, not that you want somebody looking over your shoulder, but 
the ability to look over and say, hey, I don't really understand how this detail works. Can, can we draw over this so I understand? Um, and I think that that in itself has become a little challenging. I know for me, it's been, it's been challenging because I can't lean over to my colleague and, and say this. And, and I, I know he'll, he'll watch this and know exactly what I mean because I pepper him with questions every day, or I used to pepper him with questions every day. And we don't have that dialogue or rapport anymore. And I'm thinking back to something Michael has said on, on previous panels about, you know, if this had happened 10 years ago, we wouldn't have had the capability of all working from home, and now we do. And we've set an example for universities, and a lot of faculty members are talking about how, how you know, that, that pres the precedent has been set by firms, okay, faculty members can now teach online. Um, and yet I'm preparing for, for my course for UDC in the fall, and, uh, and Kathy Dixon and I are going back and forth of how are we, how are we engaging our fourth year students in, in the details of design and, and how does that happen? And then on the flip side, Kimberly who's teaching our first year students, she's like, I've got to figure out how to show them how to draw, like how does that work? So I would suggest for anybody who's listening to this, um, the ACSA did a, a panel discussion with five faculty members from, the, from Lawrence Tech and they did this fantastic, fantastic presentation on how to step up the studio, the studio culture so that you still have that culture, but it's all virtual. And they're using all kinds of different softwares and different technologies, and you're creating private virtual spaces versus public virtual spaces for your students to engage with you versus engage with the class. And I sat there listening to this, and I was like, first of all, wow, I'm excited to implement that for our studio. But I feel like everybody should go and watch this because I think that those are those, it, it's giving, it almost it can be, it absolutely could be applied to the professional world to say, okay, can I create a virtual space that I'm throwing drawings up and I'm throwing sketches up and then, you know, somebody can, can go into my space just like they would for a desk and be like, oh, Gina, you want to draw this a little differently and then draw on my drawings in that space. I think the the applications now, it's going to work in reverse. What are colleges and universities doing over the next couple months that we can then adopt into the profession that's going to make it easier for us to continue managing uh, working from home? Gina, that's, that's, that's amazing. Would you send the link um, and we'll post it on the website? Please? Yeah. I'm crazy about uh, this so presentation. Everybody I talk to, I'm telling about it. <laughs> I'm, going to ask, I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll move on. Uh, and this is, you know, I hate to even ask it in this way, but you know, silver linings, you know, this is a disaster. This is a, it's a disaster for humanity. It's way too many people have died. So to think about it in terms of silver linings kind of breaks my heart. But I, I do want to think about like, what are any good things that have come out of this? Like, let's maybe try to end on a positive note uh, before we move into questions. Um, a rediscovering of community. The one thing that um, that's happened for me is that I've lived in my neighborhood for 26 years and I know my immediate neighbors to the left and right, but I really don't know, you know, the people beyond that. But, you know, the one thing that's really amazing is how many people are out on the streets. And I mean, obviously, you've got to do all the right protocols, but just getting to know my neighbors, you know, more deeply than I ever have has been a, a silver lining. I think going from meeting to meeting via Zoom versus in your car and the energy just being saved and the time that's being saved, that's been really interesting. I think that's going to change how we at least mm -hmm. do meetings. Yeah, and you mentioned commuting. I've gained, you know, an hour and a half a day. So mm -hmm. I'm like working out every day instead. And it's like, <laughs> I mean, yeah. not all the time, because I do feel, especially now I'm like working towards the deadline. And when you're on those weeks, that sort of goes out the window. But that I feel is like the same even when we were in the office. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I do find that like, I just feel less stressed of like, oh, I have to go there and I have to put my face on and I have to like be the social person. And it's like, you can do, you know, you can do the virtual stuff and still like, I can go downstairs and, you know, hug my daughter at any time during the day. And that just feels nice to, um, yeah, to just have that available. And like my daughter sometimes runs in from the store and I show her to the, to everybody because it's part of my life. So I think someone mentioned this before, just like, you're kind of exposing your personal life more to your coworkers, which I think makes sense. And then the, sticking on the, se uh, the theme of sustainability, not having to get on an airplane and go to a meeting. God, I'm just hallelujah. <laughs> but it is tough to like, I think, connect with um, younger people, like you were saying, Gina. And I think 
Um, I'm sure you guys have all sort of had trial and error, like at the beginning of this, we were sort of doing larger meetings and I've noticed that, you know, you get smaller four to six people meetings and it's much more fruitful. People are comfortable being on camera. And so like, I think the trial and error of like how this, how we, do you create a community virtually um, has actually been kind of fun to discover. And then, you know, as a leader at Smith Group in the architecture discipline, um, bringing people together and still feeling like you're part of this firm um, has been, you know, challenging on virtually. And I don't think you can ever really replicate the physical part. But um, I do think it's been interesting to see how we, how different people have connected in their own ways virtually. Yeah, I think uh, one thing for us, we had just at the beginning of the year, right before COVID started, had initiated a program that we borrowed from another firm. Uh, where every Thursday evening we do a, we did a pinup and that was starting we were starting to get some traction and then all of a sudden like COVID hit and all of a sudden you know the office you know everyone was at home and um, I think it's forced us to you know to we, we wanted to perpetuate the program so we kept it going but it also really forced us to learn how to communicate more effectively on Zoom and really you know how do we structure that where if you've got a grid of 10 or 12 people where you can get participation from everybody. And it really, in some ways, we kind of had to go back to the basics and, and think about the topics we were looking at, how they were presented. Um, and so really, I think that that benefit has actually helped us in terms of presenting ideas through a Zoom or teleconference interface. And so I think it's really, the benefit is just that the value that uh, a video conferencing call can make. And, and, you know, and we're appreciative that all of our clients and our consultants seem to have bought onto this idea. but. You know, I think there's this, the, the sheer number of meetings and, and time we have to spend traveling from one site to another has been reduced. So that's, that's been huge because it gives us a little bit more time to do the things that we really want to do, which is not drive a car. <laughs> yes. Okay. On that note, oh, can I get uh, mine really quickly? Because everybody else got to go. I'll share mine really fast. I, I, my silver linings are that I call my parents more regularly, which is, is really nice. I'm able to make a hot lunch and I'm eating healthier. And so I hope everybody else is making hot lunches because it's fantastic. And then there was something Christina said the other day about, about being creative and having the space to be creative. I've been in CA land for over a year and a half. And I, I'm hoping you can tell from my personality that, that living in CA land is, is, is very tough for me. So I actually have my desk is completely set up for, um, I make, do mixed media art and it is like a hot mess of paint and charcoal and pastels. And when I need a little bit of a break, I take five to 10 minutes and I go make something and then I come back and I keep working and whoa, my brain is so much clearer. So I hope other people out there are taking those small moments that you can now get away from the computer to do something to reinvigorate yourself. Well, that's great that you call your parents. I have to have you talk to my son. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all for, for amazing answers. Uh, Sinclair, uh, I'm going to hand it back to you to, to moderate the, the, the questions from the audience. Great. Well, we have a lot of uh, great questions coming in here. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with this one. Uh, this uh, attendee writes, to promote real change in the design profession, we need all parties and positions of power to join the table, but that is much easier said than done. What is AIDC willing and able to do in order to promote, leverage, and challenge those individuals, organizations, and firms to be a part of this process for change? There's a lot there. Yeah, well, I, I guess I would say, I would go back to some of the suggestions we had earlier, which was my first question, frankly, is what can we do? Uh, Michael and, and Gina, um, I, I understand no one's working on a checklist. Yeah. Um, I think sort of that, that holding firms accountable that seems like I'm really interested in hearing more about that. Uh, and so I think that's probably the, the first place I would go. Yeah. You know, as, I, I think the key word in that question was leverage. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so uh, the chapter does have that leverage. So somehow we have to institute that as a requirement. I think that's, that's where our strength is in terms of how we're collaborating together and how we're developing the relationship between our, our two organizations. That, I mean, I'm really enjoying it, I think. And I think if, if you join us for the forum this evening, you'll see it in, in, its, in its full strength of how we're, how we're really, you know, collaborating together. But I, I, I agree with what Michael said when we look at this ta with task force within DC NOMA and say, okay, we're developing this as a resource. How can we work together with AIA DC to then push it out and use, I think in some ways, use DC as a case study to say, okay, we're, we're all collaborating together here because there's no one group, there's no one firm that can do this right. We all have to be participating in this. And then how can this 
set an example for other places around the country, especially other places who may not have the same resources of the same, you know, NOMA might be a statewide chapter as opposed to a local chapter. How can they start to develop those similar relationships? And we do have a diversity here in, in D.C. As, as a sample. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, we do. I wonder if, like, I don't know if this is a thing, but, like, I wonder if, like, if there's a central repository on AIA DC, I know that, you know, lots of clients do come to AIA's website to look up architects and stuff. So is there a place where there is like, you know, and I'm not sure how hard this would be to maintain, but you know, that it does show which firms have these groups going on so that, you know, as someone's researching firms that they're like, Oh, look at, this is a list of firms that care about equity at this moment. And at least <laughs> that that's like a pay, I don't know. Uh, we're, we're working on that list. I oh, started. I started yeah, we're. Yeah, and you know, I started. I started, and again, this is where that collaboration comes into play. And it's. I have to tell you, I, I'm having so much fun working with the Equity Committee and Lida and and the and the Asian American Designers Union because we're playing off of each other. So we started with the large firms in the D.C. area, and we compiled. We said, okay, everybody who signed the signed the statement with Noma in at the at the end of June, at the end of May who's in the DC area, okay, what do you have on your websites? And it was sorely disappointing to see, okay, everybody put something on social media, but they're not quite ready to put it on their websites. And then you think of, you know, if you want to get, if you want to go work at a firm, I would not go work for a whole bunch of these firms because it doesn't look like they're talking about it, right? And yet they are talking about it. And so I think it works both ways. I think one way it's a repository to say, okay, here's what people are doing. And firms have to be willing to share that. And on the other side, recognizing, and I, I hope we, we start to develop this from this forum this evening, is we have to be sharing this and coming forward and saying, this is what I'm doing. It might work well. We're going to see in, an, in a month or two. We'll come back to you and share. How are we all sharing together what we're doing? And, and I would also add this evening, we have uh, representatives from small, medium, and mega firms coming to the table to talk about their experiences. So it's not just, hey, you know, I'm, I'm curious about the large firm roundtable, but we, we wanted to make sure that we have a diverse uh, set of voices for the panel and then, and then we're opening it up for everybody to start talking and sharing, which should be awesome. Great, okay, uh, so Claire, the next, next question. Uh, great, our next question here is, part of the focus is about representation, equity, and inclusion within an architecture firm, but there is also a huge piece about how we become more aware and inclusive designers. How do we as architects do a better job of finding justice in our design practices? What can AIADC do to help? I mean, in some ways, this goes back to the ADA analog, right? It wasn't that architects said, we're going to make put elevators in buildings and put ramps in and make buildings more inclusive. It was a response to a, a building code or a jurisdictional requirement, right? And so I think the law has to change. Uh, and I don't know what, what form that takes, but I think, you know, we tend to be reactive in the sense that we react to a building code or a zoning code or, code or accessibility code or an energy code. Um, and it's not that we want to be reactive, but we're in a position where we have clients um, who, you know, we're having, you know, helping to uh, helping them comply with these codes and in doing so educating ourselves and educating them that there's value. So I think the, the question is, how, you know, what is the analog for um, social equity, you know, in the form of an ADA-like enterprise in, in the 21st century? And it's funny, I think some of that's going to come from government policy. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. And in our case, I'm saying uh, local government policy, you know, at least our mayor is sort of stepping up now with some of the public private partnerships mm -hmm. that that they're asking. No, they're demanding diversity and equity in some of these projects that previously um, it, it, it didn't really matter. And developers just came in and did their thing mm -hmm. and left. But they now want these projects to look like um, our population and and the diversity in our population. So um, our architects can do only, I think, so much that we have to be met halfway um, mm. with the jurisdiction we're functioning in. So, yeah. uh, and, and part of that could be that we sort of, um, you know, push our legislators, you know, to, to adopt some of these things too. And I think yeah, I, I was going to I was going to say this because I don't want to put a plug in for Mary. Mary has a great relationship and has done a wonderful job. It's it's sort of building a bridge to uh, you know DCRA and the like 
and maybe the the uh, the thing here is what you said, Michael, is for us to be a catalyst to bring those initiatives to them, and show them the value of implementing these initiatives, and get the and get them to to join us. Mary, there you go. You got something to do next year. Well, I think we've been talking. Um, we've been talking actually with the um, with the director, and uh, he's talking with the board of architecture about um, having a um, a particular licensing education licensing requirement. So we are already having those discussions, but it can be much broader than than we have. And I also think if if you can talk to uh, the deputy mayor for economic development right. again. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, there, there's one thing with the license, but then there's the other, the, the financial part of this is, is the equity in uh, those public private partnerships where right. we're, a, we're all of... paying our taxes for one way or yeah. the other. Right. So, yeah, yeah, that's huge with publicly funded projects, you know, at least in higher education work, like, uh, you know, they require that a, the contract requires that, you know, the a percentage of the contractors and consultants you know, our minority owned businesses. So I think that that's a, you know, a step in the right direction. And you wonder if that can be expanded into the private contracts as well. And where it just becomes expected exactly. and client, mm -hmm. client yeah, contracts yeah. require that. Um, it's, it's legislation that matters on this topic. Right, exactly. I, I want to go back to the, the question itself though. And I think that, and, and Rob, at some point I was saying about how we are, we are advocate advocates, architects as advocates. And I also think it's, it's, architects as instigators, because we're in a unique position to say, if we don't design it for you, it's not going to get built, right? Like you, you've got to have us in order to, to create new spaces and to, to build the city. And so I think, and I have a funny feeling this is where this question was going, but it's everything from talking about prisons and jails. And do we take us as, as a community of architects, do we take a stance on this? And I'm not taking a stance. I'm just saying this is one side of it all the way to as, as we're working with developers who, and you can look in, in Northeast DC, these apartment buildings are just popping up like crazy. How are we saying to developers, are you really creating a space that welcomes a community that recognizes the diversity of DC, both in terms of, of people, but also in terms of socioeconomic status and the differences, the, the vast differences that are growing so much right now because of COVID, how are we challenging the people that we're working with to say, you, we can design you a better space that is going to last, to, I forgot who said it, but, but a, the, a better space is going to last much longer that you're not going to have to rip down, but it's also going to help communities thrive and become, become the healthy communities that they, they want and they see themselves becoming, but they don't necessarily have the place to do that. Right. Instigate. Yeah, that really <laughs> I like that. Okay, I think I think we're about out of time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and say that if there are any any additional questions, uh, either in the chat or in the Q and A, uh, we will address them as we did before uh, through our website. And um, we will. I see, um, Gina. I think you posted that that um, link to the chat. But we'll also make sure. But, we yeah, I think Mary did somewhere, but I'll I'll send it so we make sure we put it up again. Exactly. Um, so I would. On behalf of the panel and the, the, the IADC, I want to thank all of you for joining and all of you who listen to this in the future on YouTube. Uh, these are both extremely important topics that, that we've never really had to face uh, at this level before. Uh, and so um, I'm, I'm thankful that we are addressing the issue of social justice. I think it's, it's a long time coming. And uh, I know that my eyes are being opened on a day-to-day -day basis. I continue to learn more and more uh, and then with COVID-19, you know, the, the future is uncertain, but I know that we will rise to the challenge of, of designing to, to, for that. So thank you all for your attendance, and uh, we look forward to our next town hall with you next month. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.